All right, hi everyone. Uh, as the last few people get settled in, get some food, I'm gonna go ahead and make the introductions here. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to our seventh session of Animal Law Weeks 2020. Super excited that we have two weeks this year and an amazing set of speakers. Um, before we get going, I should let everyone know that this talk is being video recorded. Um, and I'd like to, you know, on behalf of the Animal Law Society here at Harvard Law School, I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors and constant supporters, the Animal Law and Policy Program. For those of you who are students, please check it out, get involved in the clinics and all the other resources we have here. Um, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Megan Watkins, the CEO of Farm Sanctuary. Uh, the talk of today's, uh, the, uh, the title of today's talk is The Power of Sanctuary. Um, Megan has been an advocate in this field for two decades and since 1986, Farm Sanctuary has been combating the abuses of animal agriculture by advocating for institutional reform as well as increasing awareness of the powers of a cruelty-free uh, plant-based living lifestyle. Um, Megan, as I mentioned, has spent two decades championing, championing vulnerable populations. She has, I think, great experience in the private sector as well, having previously been the MD um, for the national, uh, national, and a national practice executive, sorry, in, in the yeah. film, <laughs> yes, in the philanthropic solutions group at U.S. Trust, and previously having advised individual corporate and family wealth clients of U.S. Trust and Merrill Lynch on philanthropic management and strategy, and directing hundreds of millions of dollars into charitable programs that have made a huge impact. Um, Prior to all of that, you were a VP at J.P. Morgan in a similar role, uh, directing the Philanthropic Services Group, and where, where Megan managed the client, uh, managed the client and grant portfolio focused on animal welfare um, and protection, community development, and human services. So, just an enormous amount of, like a lifetime of service in this field. And now we get to hear about Farm Sanctuary. I'm super excited. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Megan Watkins. So much. Um, Chris in the back, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Thank you to everyone in the room who helped to coordinate today. It's incredibly exciting for me to be back in Harvard Square. Um, I am not a Harvard alum, but I spent many of my teenage years bumming around Harvard Square, so that means something, I suppose. Um, it's really a privilege to be here, and it's inspiring for me to be in the room with all of you who have a deep interest in the field of animal rights, and in particular, who have shown up today to talk about farm animal rights and the farm sanctuary movement. Um, you all are the future leaders of this movement, all of the students in this room, and that gives me great hope and great excitement and great energy. And so I hope we'll capture some of that in the discussion at the end of the presentation today. As a brief overview of what I'm planning to cover, I thought we'd start with just a brief history of farm sanctuary, um, talk a bit about the scale, the magnitude of the problem that is affecting not only farm animals, but society at large, and then move into how Farm Sanctuary, but also other organizations in the movement have evolved to meet the changing needs of the farm animal landscape. Concerns related to the environment, to public health, to social justice. Uh, before we take a more specific look at some of the program strategies that we employ within the field to change hearts and change minds about farm animals and about food systems. From there, we'll spend a couple of moments just talking about this great moment of mainstreaming that farm animal rights and veganism and plant-based living seems to be experiencing right now, and why that's so meaningful for an organization like Farm Sanctuary, for other sanctuaries and animal rights organizations in the movement, and per Chris's suggestion, for me. Uh, why did I choose to make the transition into the role that I'm in just about 14 months ago, and why was it the right time for someone like me within the organization of Farm Sanctuary? At the end, as I mentioned, I'm really hoping that we can have a nice discussion together. And I've got a few questions where I might be interested in hearing from you, and I hope that you all will as well. So let's get started. OK. Who knows who Jean Bauer is? Oh. And it's law school, so I can call on someone, right? <laughs> but does anyone want to shout it out? Who's Jean Bauer? What did Jean Bauer do? Excellent. <laughs> So Jean Bauer is the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. And in the picture that you see up here, he was a young activist who made the radical decision to rescue a live sheep off of a pile of dead animals during an animal investigation 
at a historic site, the Lancaster Stockyards in Pennsylvania. This discarded sheep who you see in the middle photo was later named Hilda. You see her picture on the right. Uh, she was the start of Farm Sanctuary. And essentially, she was the start of the farm animal sanctuary movement of today. Interesting to note, as you see the picture of Hilda on the right, once left for dead, Hilda went on to live for 11 years at Sanctuary and lived out a beautiful life at Farm Sanctuary. She also inspired Farm Sanctuary's first major advocacy effort, which was a campaign against Lancaster Stockyards to stop the slaughter of sick and downed animals into the food system. It had far-reaching effects. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. If you've seen Jean speak, which it seems like a lot of you have, you'll see in the top left a picture of Jean selling meatless hot dogs. This was where the organization got its first financial support. Uh, veggie hot dogs, Grateful Dead concerts, open-minded audience. This was where Farm Sanctuary really first took off. So what are we here to address today? Um, factory farms, as I think many of you know, dominate US food production. Many employ fairly abusive practices, maximizing profit, sometimes at the expense of the environment, communities, certainly animal welfare, oftentimes our health. Animals are raised in extreme confinement. Some undergo painful mutilations. And many are bred to grow unnaturally fast and unnaturally large in order to maximize the production of meat, of eggs, of milk. And quite frankly, the numbers of animals are unfathomable. Let's take a look at that for a minute. These are global estimations, and they're a little bit tricky to come by. So we've combined a few sources, landing us in a place where we feel fairly confident that about 133,000 land animals are killed for food every minute. That translates into 8 million every hour, 200 million every day, and 72 billion land animals killed for food every year. The numbers alone are staggering. As we come to know some of the animals that we'll talk about as individuals, I think it will take your breath away as you think about the number of individuals in this system. And the implications are devastating. Beyond the inhumane practices, we're thinking about far factory farming and major contributions to deforestation, air, water pollution. Um, we've seen a lot in the news around the clearing of rainforests and land to raise livestock, to feed livestock, a need for additional crops to feed livestock. There's a release of methane gas that most of us know about that happens during the digestion process and factory farms increasingly are serving as concentrated sources of these gas emissions. Water. Well, water's needed to grow feed crops. Animals need to drink water. Tons of water is needed to clean farms and slaughterhouses and transport trucks. Farm animals produce more than 1 million tons of manure every day in the United States. This is stored in open air lagoons. Um, it can contain undigested antibiotics. These sort of lakes of waste, as it were, can leak, can spill, can flood, can contaminate other water sources, often killing fish populations. And the lagoons themselves are often emptied with a spraying system. So a system of spraying manure that's also emitting gas and frankly, a really unbearable stench. The environmental destruction is global, but people are suffering through the impacts of this daily at the local level, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, the overall impact going far beyond the environment to also affecting people's personal health and public health and having detrimental impacts with regard to social justice. We're gonna take a look as I flip this slide to an example in North Carolina. Um, I wanna focus specifically on the pig industry for a minute. Uh, Sunday was National Pig Day. I don't know if that means anything to anyone, but it feels like a fitting, a fitting example. In North Carolina, there are nine million pigs and 10 million people. In some counties in North Carolina, pigs actually outnumber people. Pigs produce 10 times more waste 
than humans. The manure lagoons in North Carolina could fill the equivalent of 15,000 swimming pools. I'm gonna now introduce you to a woman in the next video named Elsie Herring. Um, Elsie is a resident of North Carolina. She lives on a property that was purchased by her grandfather. Interestingly, her grandfather had been a slave who was freed in 1891. And the next clip shows the reality of Elsie's life today after a pig farming operation moved in next door. Well, before the hog industry came in, we could sit outside and have family over, friends over, do your gardening, you know, not having to worry about the odor and the mist. Just on the other side of these trees, uh, there's a spray field, and this is where they spray animal waste on us. They're polluting our, my air and others, everyone that's living near these facilities. They've polluted our water. They've disrupted our quality of life. So why are we being subjected to being forced to live with animals in their waste so the pork industry can make profit? I think that's wrong. Okay, so in contrast to that, what are farm animal sanctuaries and who is farm sanctuary? Farm animal sanctuaries exist in very stark contrast to the animal agriculture industry. While rescue and refuge for farm animals, which I will go into in a moment, is they are fundamental to farm animal sanctuaries, we've really come to understand the concept of sanctuary as even more meaningful. Um, sanctuary is a concept for a safe place for all individuals, for all beings, to be themselves, to be free from harm, to be empowered to make choices, and to live according to their values. We like to believe that sanctuaries model a new way to live with farm animals, but also ideally with each other. I wanna play for you now a quick snippet of what we call the power of sanctuary. Sanctuaries are a place where cruelty is met with kindness. It's about kindness to animals, but it's also about respecting others, respecting ourselves, respecting the earth, living in a way that doesn't cause unnecessary harm. We live at a time when there's immense oppression and strain and ugliness out in the world, and this harms all of us. The reason things are as bad as they are is because we have infrastructures and systems in place and those need to be shifted. It actually undermines our empathy and that's a very important part of our humanity. For me and for many people, this begins with recognizing trauma and violence and cruelty in the world and not wanting to be part of it. These animals, like other animals, want to live. They don't want to be abused, they don't want to be killed, they don't want to be eaten. They want to live just like cats or dogs or us. We're all animals and we all have pretty much the same desires. I got this van in California in the early mid 1980s. We used this van to do investigations of farms, stockyards, and slaughterhouses. And the way we funded the organization back in those days was selling vegan hot dogs at Grateful Dead shows out of this van. It was an open minded crowd. And I remember on occasion somebody would come up and stand in front of our table and look at these images and just be affected by them and start crying. Hilda. Our first rescued animal was rescued in this van, who we found left on a pile of dead animals behind Lancaster stockyards in Pennsylvania. So we took her off the dead pile, brought her to a veterinarian, thinking she would have to be euthanized. 
as the veterinarian was examining her, she actually started perking up and then she stood up. And she lived with us for more than 10 years. And she's actually buried uh, up on the farm right now. It's not possible for sanctuaries to rescue all the animals who are currently being exploited and slaughtered. So we need to change the system. And farm sanctuaries play a very important role in modeling a different kind of relationship with other animals. The animals become ambassadors and people who are touched by them can go out and educate others. I want everyone to cozy up. My name is Joanne MacArthur. I'm a photojournalist. I've been photographing our relationship with animals around the world for over 15 years now. This is one of the most important things about sanctuaries that we have to take into account. You rescue animals and you invite people to meet the individuals. They might come here and decide to eat fewer animals or go vegan, or they might go out into the world a changed person. They might become an activist. How can you possibly put a dollar sign on that? You can't. It changed me and it, as I said, it set me on this path of activism for life. And I have reached millions of people now through my work because I was inspired by sanctuary. Farm Sanctuary has been a touchstone for so many people who have gone on to do amazing activism. Some of them have founded organizations, some travel the world exposing cruelty and educating people about what humans do to other animals. I did a furniture movement for like 16 years in the five boroughs. I knew nothing about farms, man. So she asked me, uh, she's like, hey, can you help me with this little piglet? I fell in love like instantly. So all that Spanish stuff, eating pork my whole life, went right out the window, man. Any rescues, any emergencies, yeah, I'm, I'm there for them. So I haven't had an animal food product since the day after my heart attack. With distance from the eating machine and propaganda, I was able to kind of see, oh, there's a whole completely different way to live. Ironically healthier. It took me my first 10 years before I became a vegan for ethical reasons. Seeing them in this environment being well cared for, it can be life changing. Part of coming here to Farm Sanctuary, you know, made me aware of these invisible animals, as I call them, and that they're not represented. We don't see them. And how can we start to consider them at all if we're not seeing them and talking about them? Sanctuary to me just means a safe haven. All beings deserve that. Um, we have, you know, people who are escaping horrible situations, animals that are escaping horrible situations, and need that sanctuary. Every animal should be in one, and every person too. This part of Western New York was not too far from the roots of the Underground Railroad, and when Farm Sanctuary first got this property, you know, I felt pretty good knowing that this tradition of liberating individuals from oppression and exploitation had been part of this area. Providing a level of education so people can mindfully change their actions works to the goal of rescuing all of the animals. You know, Farm Sanctuary is a place, but it's also a mission. The idea is to rescue individuals and then ultimately to change the world. Okay, so hopefully that video helped to underscore not only the impact of animal agriculture, but also to demonstrate what happens when people are able to interact with individual animals in a safe and free environment. And you will find beautiful scenes like what we just saw at the end of that film at independent farm animal sanctuaries across the country. As for Farm Sanctuary and who we are, you just heard quite a bit from our founder, Jean Bauer. Um, I like to think of us as a comprehensive farm animal rights and protection organization. Farm Sanctuary has been fighting against the abuses of factory farming for 34 years, 35th anniversary coming up next year, <coughs> while at the same time building an awareness of the sentience of farm animals and the benefits of cruelty-free plant-based living. We educate people about the plight of farm animals and the effects of factory farming. 
We advocate for laws, for policies, to prevent suffering, to promote compassion, and obviously we rescue and provide sanctuary. Uh, you saw a lot of footage there from our animal sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York, upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. The animals on sanctuary in turn have become ambassadors. Uh, through their stories, people have changed their hearts and minds, uh, again, about farm animals and food systems. So we talked at the beginning about diving into a few program strategies that the sanctuary movement employs. Um, let's talk about sanctuary and rescue first. So again, you know, back to the beginning, back to Jean, back to Hilda, what started as this radical act of rescue in 1986 inspired a grassroots movement to provide farm animals with sanctuary across the country and frankly now across the world raising the profile of these animals who mostly go unseen. As I just mentioned, you can visit sanctuaries across the country. So we have our upstate New York and our California sanctuaries. There are a few farm animal sanctuaries right here in New England, and they are beautiful venues and places where one can meet and interact and learn about these individual animals and their stories. Farm sanctuary and other sanctuaries across the country receive daily requests to come in and rescue animals from situations of abuse and neglect. It might be a backyard butcher. It might be an owner surrender, someone who had an animal who can no longer care for that animal. There may have been a transport accident. There may have been an escapee, um, maybe even a hoarding case. So this next slide is an example of what happens before and what happens after rescue and coming to sanctuary? In 2019, um, just last year, we were called about a cruelty case in Pennsylvania. This was a small dairy that was going under, not so uncommon to hear about these days. The humane officer in Pennsylvania arrived at the scene and unfortunately already seven of the cows on site had died and four were left chained. Um, they were left chained in the dark, with no ventilation, stuck in about two feet of feces. Um, in fact, the littlest one, and I hate to say this over lunch, <laughs> but was, was buried pretty much up to her neck. On the right, you see Nina and Chanterelle, who are two survivors of this scenario, very much on a path to healing physically and emotionally. And as I said, not such an uncommon situation. Um, in 2019, we have a calf named Stanton who came to our sanctuary, who was the only survivor from a small farm. And in 2018, two additional, um, Liz and Cashew, who came from a failing dairy, one where the owner had to choose between the animal welfare standards and the profitability of the business. So the reality is, um, and we'll say this a couple times, we can't possibly rescue all of these animals. That said, we, along with other organizations in the field, do try to invest in building the field and the sanctuary field and community to take in, upon a need for a rapid response, the animals that do need rescue and care. Um, one way that we've done this, we started an animal care conference where we invite individuals who have considered starting a farm animal sanctuary or someone who has started rescue fairly recently and is looking for guidance, training, hands-on opportunities to really learn about animal care and the administrative operations of sanctuary. There are other organizations out there, like the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, GFAS, um, that actually accredits animal sanctuaries and provides standards of excellence. We also launched an animal adoption network. So we have thousands of animals that have been rescued and provided transport who are now living in safe, compassionate homes that we vetted through that adoption network. And because we have spent the last several minutes um, in this not so fortunate case, I'm gonna just share with you one story that's a little bit more upbeat.
Okay, so that was Seymour. Seymour's a really special character. Uh, and Seymour came from a water buffalo dairy. He was used as a breeder. Water buffalo dairies being, as some might guess, fairly obviously produce uh, buffalo mozzarella. The dairy shut down, and in this case, Seymour's guardian made the decision to try to find him a home. So this is where you saw our facilities team uh, jump in and start working on moving Seymour to a permanent home with Critter Creek Farm Sanctuary as a permanent placement. Seymour is now in Florida, enjoying the life and um, certainly enjoying the water. He's one example of how these animals serve as ambassadors representing billions that are caught in a system. Uh, they're stories of survival, and I think hopefully you experienced you know, tales of their sentience, reached tens of millions of people through social media. He was actually one of our most popular, and uh, also, of course, the thousands who visit sanctuaries every year. The impact of storytelling is huge. Um, I mentioned highlighting sentience really helps people relate to the animals. Um, provokes conversation, and encourages change. We find that they're a really good way to deliver a high impact narrative without needing to put forward so much of the negative imagery that comes with factory farms, really as a balance to some of those necessary realities that happen in investigations that are undertaken by many of our peer organizations which I respect a great deal. Um, again, while we can't save all who are suffering in the system, we know that sanctuary can heal those who are rescued, and we know that can fundamentally impact the people who hear their stories, who witness their will to live, and who come to understand each of these individuals really as individuals and not as products. So it's impossible to get everybody to visit Sanctuary. Uh, we would love and we welcome all of you, certainly, to come and visit. But we also need to think about ways in which we can get that broad messaging out to the public. And one of the ways that we started doing this in 2017 was by launching a humane education program. Um, oftentimes, sanctuaries like ours provide education to visitors who are coming on tours. Uh, we are telling the stories of the individual animals. Through this program, um, we bring curriculum actually into the classroom to allow students, and oftentimes in urban areas, to meet the animals using, as you can see in the picture, virtual reality. Um, there are in-classroom presentations. There are free curricula for teachers to download. There's a youth advocacy initiative. And all of this is really done with the goal of building awareness among young people, not only about the, the lives of farm animals, the complexity of the contemporary agricultural system, but also how to lead the way toward a more just and sustainable food system. Uh, we have a research collaborator out of UCLA, Dr. Jenny Jay, who's done a lot of studying on this topic and really has found that as youth are educated around the environmental impacts of the food system, they do start to make dietary changes. And as I think about the deep passion of these young people who have this environmental awareness, are committed to social justice, and naturally possess this compassion for these animals, it's pretty inspiring. I think these are the folks who are really going to help us to create lasting change. I'm sure that advocacy is a topic that's popular in this room. Um, it's impossible for me to talk about advocacy without talking about partnerships and collaboration. You know, since the beginning, we've been an organization that has partnered with and sometimes led um, with other animal rights organizations on ballot initiatives, state and federal legislation, litigation, and corporate consumer outreach. I mentioned earlier that Farm Sanctuary's original advocacy campaign was against that Lancaster stockyard and the slaughter of downed animals. For folks who don't know, downed animals refers to those who are too sick to be able to walk to slaughter. And that campaign did have fairly far-reaching effects. Um, in the 1990s, Farm Sanctuary launched a decade-long campaign to prevent the slaughter of downed cows. We sued the USDA, and we were successful in that effort. In 2015, we petitioned the USDA to ban the slaughter of downed pigs. 
not only because it posed serious risks, <coughs> downed pigs being a serious risk to the animals themselves, but also, of course, to food safety. And in 2019, our petition was denied. So, as recently as last month, we joined with a coalition of other organizations on behalf of downed animals, Animal Legal Defense Fund, the Animal Welfare Institute, Animal Outlook, Mercy for Animals, Farm Forward, together suing the USDA and the Secretary of Agriculture for failing to protect downed pigs. We're currently engaged in two other lawsuits against the USDA, uh, one having to do with the deregulation of the pig slaughter process, and then the denial of um, our request for them to post slaughterhouse records online in accordance with the Federal Freedom of Information Act. We've got another lawsuit going on uh, challenging North Carolina's ag-gag law. For those who aren't familiar with ag-gag, I mean, this is an attempt to deter undercover investigations of agricultural facilities. This is something that we have joined forces with PETA, with ALDF, Center for Food Safety, Food and Water Watch, the ASPCA, the Government Accountability Project, Farm Forward, you see that the list of groups grows and also starts to diversify. And we've sponsored legislation in California and worked with a collaborative in New York to ban the sale of foie gras in both California and New York. And then finally, and this is a fun one, who's tried the Impossible Whopper? <laughs> Almost everybody. So before the Impossible Whopper, and my guess maybe still, there is the BK Veggie Burger. And the BK Veggie Burger actually started as the result of a local campaign at the Burger King in Watkins Glen, New York, home base of Farm Sanctuary. The organization had petitioned that Burger King to add a veggie burger to the menu, and that was actually the beginning of the national rollout of the veggie burger. So, what does it mean when we think about what had been a fairly radical movement and moment in time and now having this mainstream moment? You know, in, in the 34 years since Farm Sanctuary was founded, obviously a lot has changed. Uh, science has confirmed the inhumane, the disastrous impacts of animal agriculture. The result of that has been the beginning of our being able to witness a new food economy, right, based on plants. And honestly, the spark of a cultural awakening toward these issues. There's a whole generation today of young people who have never consumed an animal product. No meat, no eggs, no dairy. Um, in fact, according to market research, and this is particularly from, I think, NPT, NPD group, 12% of millennials today identify as vegetarian or vegan, and 11% of baby boomers, which is a pretty incredible statistic. That personal choice to become vegan, whether for animal rights, environment, social justice, other reasons, it's a lifestyle choice that is now being supported by a growing economy. It is making it more accessible, and it is making it more acceptable. Do, do folks know UBS? investment firm. So UBS came out with a statistic recently predicting that the plant-based meat alternatives industry over the course of the next 10 years will grow in value from four and a half billion dollars today to 85 billion dollars in value by 2030. It's a pretty incredible moment. So this is, this is taking us toward the end of the formal component of this presentation and an acknowledgement that farm animal rights, veganism, these are no longer issues that live on the fringe. The efforts of many activists over the past several decades have resulted in this growing awareness and acceptance. And again, for any number of reasons, increasingly people are opting for more plant-based foods. This makes our job Farm Sanctuary's job of building public awareness and pushing for reforms even more important. Reason being, we feel the time is now. So Chris asked me to talk a little bit about my transition into this position, uh, knowing that I came on fairly recently to take this seat at Farm Sanctuary. I had been a volunteer board member with the organization for some time. And I had witnessed, along with other folks involved with the organization, so many of the shifts 
that were occurring. So the increase in sanctuaries that we see across the country, the rise in incredible vegan food, the rise in incredible sustainable cruelty-free fashion. <laughs> and I think we all started to realize that there's a window of opportunity opening for the movement and that Farm Sanctuary was really in a unique position to capture this growing energy and to bring back then broad public awareness and attention to the plight of farm animals. Not only that, but also to support the real change that we are now seeing in consumer behavior. So I spent 17 years in the private sector before coming to Farm Sanctuary. I had been nonprofit prior to that, but 17 years in the private sector. Most of my work was speaking with family-owned businesses, other individuals, corporations, who wanted to affect a degree of social change. These were philanthropically minded individuals and companies with whom I would have conversations with the goal of identifying what were really their driving values, their most deeply held values. How could we use those values to, as a platform to build a strategy to change a landscape? That could be anything from youth aging out of foster care to building a new financial model of support for investigating rare diseases to providing access to quality and affordable housing or health care or education. Uh, all causes that are incredibly worthwhile, all issues that are absolutely deserving more and more public attention, but also issues that were fairly well resourced philanthropically. And so as I sat back and thought over and over about my personal values, the degree of impact personally or professionally, that I might be able to have on the things that I cared most about, you know, when this opportunity came about um, to help take Farm Sanctuary, to be a part of the sanctuary movement and moving that movement forward and even into a more mainstream spotlight, it was pretty obvious to me that it was time to make a change. Um, I started in this role, I think I mentioned, 14 months ago. I knew that the potential was huge. That to me meant that the priority really needed to be on operational strength, organizational excellence. That in my mind is what would sustain our position in the movement, allow us to help to lead this movement. And subsequently, we launched last year a number of initiatives designed to support people and culture within the organization, align roles and responsibilities within the organization, think about things like risk mitigation and infrastructure before now having a moment to really zero in on strategy and focus and our growing board of directors. All of this will continue to happen, will continue to be my area of focus. Again, I come to the table not as the advocacy expert, not as the environmental expert or the public <coughs> health expert or the educator, but really as someone who's committed to the organization in terms of strength, in terms of opportunity, and in moving us to the next chapter. So as this work continues, we'll now have the opportunity, now in 2020, to work with our board of directors on a refreshed strategic agenda that's going to guide us into the next phase of this movement and help us to determine how our team will create the most positive change for farm animals. And with that, I'm gonna close and we can open up for questions. Hi, thank you very much for your talk and for all of your hard work. Um, you mentioned accreditation, and I'm curious about that uh, process and wondering if you can say a bit more about it because I'm new to this area, and when I was looking for a sanctuary to take my son to, I quickly realized that there are a number of organizations that are using the term sanctuary, but they're really, it sounded like 
you know, based on their websites, they're more like petting zoos. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that, uh, the process, if, if you know how many uh, organizations are currently accredited. That's a great question. So accreditation for sanctuaries is not a brand new concept, but it's a relatively new concept. The organization that I mentioned, um, the abbreviation is GFAS, the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, is an organization that was developed just for that purpose. So it's an organization that has gone through and highlighted the criteria that are incredibly important to being able to operate an animal sanctuary for the benefit of the animals and has begun accrediting institutions in that regard. Now with any process like that, there are going to be technical details and administrative components that may cause a smaller organization a need to invest an inordinate amount of time <coughs> in process, in filing for the accreditation and whatnot. Um, that is to say that currently not all wonderful sanctuaries hold an accreditation, but to your point, it can be confusing when you really want to know that the sanctuary at hand is one that truly is operating for the benefit of the animals. Um, and I know particularly in Massachusetts that's come up a couple of times with some organizations in the state. Um, I would say to start with the GFAS website and to take a look if you haven't already at who's listed. Um, one of the things actually that our donors have become interested in is how to support some of the smaller sanctuaries and organizations in seeking and securing that accreditation, knowing that that can be a stamp of approval, you know, not only for donors, but also for visitors, for families, for folks who are looking to interact with those animals. And while I don't know the number off the top of my head, I can tell you that they do have someone who specializes in farm animal sanctuaries. Um, we've gone through that process specifically for our Watkins Glen Sanctuary. In fact, we're up for a renewal application that we'll be working on this year. <coughs> Um, but it's an incredibly worthwhile process, not only to secure the accreditation, but to know that one has gone through the process and documented the policies, the protocols, the processes that really do emulate best practice. I'm from biology department. Hi. Originally, I came from India. There I see a difference between this country and India. Like in India, mostly it is a religion. Buddhist and Jainis and high caste Hindus, regardless of education, they tend to be vegetarian. Whereas here, people who are vegetarian or vegans, at least they are high school educated. I mean, from what I saw. I have two questions. So now all those farm owners, either North Carolina or somewhere else, unless they have something else for a living, to make a prop, I mean, to, to make a living, they are not going to easily give up whatever they have been doing. Then regarding climate change, since I'm a biologist, I'm interested in that aspect. Do you see any difference between Republican controlled and democratic controlled states wherein the laws being stipulated or implemented to protect animals? Mm. Or I might have to throw that one back at the crowd. I don't know if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna touch that one on politics yeah. yet. But let me think about that for a minute. Um, your question about you know, the economic reality of working in factory farming is big and tough, and this is a huge problem. I mean, this could take generations to solve. I do think it's solvable. Um, we have a real need for some projects and demonstrations, some model initiatives to see how these kinds of factory farms, employment opportunities can transition, can change. You know, earlier, so it was a few months back, we actually entered into a working relationship with a vegan cheese and butter company. Do folks know Miyoko's Creamery? So Miyoko's Creamery, which is a company that is absolutely compassionate in its approach and dedicated to this field, has now decided that for their next big foray, they are going to source an existing dairy farmer and they are going to contract with that dairy farmer for an R&D process and eventually product development that will allow that dairy farm to transition to a plant-based input that their company can use to create products. And so you see this combination, this coming together of a corporate endeavor, a struggling dairy farmer who needs to have that economic potential in order to move forward, but un undoubtedly will require an investment of training, a re-engineering, a learning of new systems and technologies. 
And then an organization like a farm sanctuary or several others who are out there kind of getting into this farm transformation arena to also continue to raise the question of the animals, right? Um, we've said many times today that it's impossible to take all of these animals in. Our first demonstration initiative with regard to this project will likely be working with a farmer who does not have an enormous number of cows on property. Um, we will need to look at whether those animals stay in place or move to sanctuary, maybe are placed with other homes. But your very important question is about, you know, how do you create the incentive for someone to move out of what might be the only economic reality for them? And I think some of these projects that are starting to take hold will hopefully be modeling that for the future. Hi, thank you so much for your time and for being here. Um, I noticed in one of the videos that you played uh, some talk about how it's impossible to put a dollar value on the interaction with individual animals. Um, and I'm wondering if you as a larger organization or have heard from smaller um, farm sanctuaries, if the sort of rise of effective altruism in the movement and yeah. impact on or like focus on specific um, measurable outcomes, if that's impacted y'all or smaller sanctuaries in some way? Sure, sure. It's a really great question. It's a really current and relevant question. Um, and I'm a both and kind of gal. <laughs> so what you're probably going to hear from me at the end is I think there's validity in a lot of these different approaches. So are folks familiar with effective, al effective altruism for the most part? I mean, we're looking at a, a problem that is enormous, right, with a large number of animals in a population. We are looking at a problem that is under-resourced. We are looking at a problem, though, that is solvable. And I do believe that there is a lot of validity in looking at approaches that address those components in a way that is geared toward impact. It is not going to be hugely beneficial or meaningful to rely only on a strategy that is emotional or one where we only want to try to do good but we're not exactly sure what we're accomplishing. Um, for Farm Sanctuary, from a values perspective, I think we fall somewhere in the middle. I would say that we have witnessed and we have the narrative outcome of what happens on sanctuary, how that does help someone to evolve in their thinking, change a mind, change a behavior, as to how that's then replicated and what that then does as we think about kind of the largesse of the movement and the outcomes that we're looking to see, we have not done enough. And so I think about us and I think about our focus on you know, we can rescue a certain number of animals. We can invite a certain number of people onto sanctuary. Maybe it's in the tens of thousands, it's certainly not in the millions. What we then can do is leverage technology to bring that sanctuary experience to a much larger audience. And that is what we've been trying to do over the course of the past couple of years. If, you've, if anyone's following social media on Farm Sanctuary, trying to get those animal stories out there, get stories of personal transformation out there, and really try to begin to evaluate what is happening in the minds of people, what is happening from psychological behavioral perspective when people learn more about the individuality of these animals. Um, it's not an area where we practice in the past, and I can tell you that it's not necessarily an area where smaller sanctuaries have focused their attention. There are a number of people who come into this rescue movement with the sheer desire to rescue as many animals from this system as they can. Um, that has meaning. Visiting with these animals has meaning. That said, uh, in order to address the scale of the challenge and the problem that's in front of us, it's not going to be enough. And so that is why I think as we're re-envisioning where we're headed strategically this year, uh, we're actually right into a strategic planning process right now in 2020 to determine not only the future of the organization, but again, the role that the organization plays in the broader movement, a lot of that dialogue is coming into play. Thank you so much uh, for your terrific talk. I'm a tiny bit ashamed to say that I'm from Big Flats, New York, uh, about 30 minutes away, and I've never been to Farm Sanctuary. We're going to change that. I know. I, I, next time, I'm home. Great. Um, but uh, I just wanted to ask, um, you, you talked a lot about like the different uh, players in the movement, and just now you, about Farm Sanctuary's role in the movement. Uh, what gaps do you see in the movement that uh, you think would be uh, you know, beneficial to, to work on? It's a really great question. 
you know, there are, I, I think I mentioned a few times that there are other sanctuaries across the country to visit, and I may have mentioned some names of some other activist or advocacy organizations, but the reality is there are a number of organizations that are working in this space and that are doing incredible work in this space. As we're moving forward and thinking about where to focus attention, um, I do believe that public awareness and education is an area where more focus could be deployed. Um, it may or may not be in the current iteration within which we provide education, but as I think about the opportunity with young people and the impact that happens in a classroom when you see a young person's mind open to the idea of animal rights, of food, of food justice, of environmental justice, um, the impact is palpable and I think deserves attention. Um, I do believe there are a number of great groups out there who are doing very <laughs> important, necessary investigation work, advocacy work, activist work. Um, I think another area where maybe we're a little bit underserved, and this, this may not speak to some of the other organizations, but I think community building. I think providing a venue, whether that's a physical venue or a virtual venue, but a place where communities can come together and where people who are part of this movement or who practice a plant-based diet feel as though they are the norm, right? They are among friends, they are among community, and whether that is a community that then goes out to dinner or whether that's a community that comes together to advocate together, to pursue a particular ballot initiative together, that is something that I think people are really yearning for in this movement. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that potentially coming up as well. Thanks again for coming and spending some time with us. Uh, pointing out sort of the, the role that academia can play in this, I think some of those lawsuits that you put up on the screen are, are being initiated by the animal law clinic, at, the farm animal law clinic at Lewis and Clark Law School. Is that correct? correct. Great. Um, and on the transitions thing um, issue, Next week, our own Animal Law and Policy Clinic is actually holding a kind of closed door round table with a bunch of the various animal protection groups that are working on that issue to try and just make sure everyone's being strategic and, and kind of analyzing the problem kind of collectively rather than having a bunch of isolated actors sort of doing it on their own in the dark. So um, that's one way that we found that we can kind of contribute. No, thank you for raising that, Chris. So very true. And I think uh, Jean will actually be attending that discussion, which is wonderful, and I would be attending. However, I will be finding myself heading to the business school for one of your executive ed programs on leading change and organizational renewal. And um, that seemed like a prime opportunity as we think about you know, what is the next phase of this movement? How do some of these organizations think about reinventing themselves or repositioning for some of what's to come? Um, we didn't talk about this as a programmatic gap, and I wouldn't necessarily say that there's a leadership gap, but I would say that there's an opportunity for leadership development among the future generation. And just following up, we're doing exactly that as well. In June, uh, Harvard Law School has its own executive education program that's really fantastic. And Scott Westfall, who runs that, is very much aligned on these animal protection issues as well. So uh, in late June, we're doing a large executive education training over three days for leadership in the animal protection movement that we're offering as a free service to the, to the movement. So yeah, it's exciting to be able to find these ways to contribute. Amazing. There is something for everybody here. It's amazing. Do we have any further questions? I, I was wondering um, if in your rescue operations you ever buy animals from farms or abuse situations, and if you think that um, that approach ever has value as a rescue tactic, or is it always counterproductive in the long term? That's a really great question, and um, one that had never occurred to me before I came into Farm Sanctuary. You now, we as an organization do have a policy in place around not purchasing animals for rescue. You can, if you're not familiar with this as a topic, if you think about maybe puppy mills or another scenario whereby you might be purchasing an animal and unknowingly investing and perpetuating a system, that is the kind of the method behind where we landed with this policy. There are partners of ours who through investigations 
have sometimes found themselves in a position to do a rescue as part of an undercover investigation. And while we ourselves as an organization haven't transacted, some of those animals have come to sanctuary out of some of those investigations. So the latter part of your question as to is there ever an opportunity where that may be valid, I think if there's an opportunity that is going to shine a spotlight on a problem that shows full circle how an animal may come in but then importantly comes out of the system, like a Hilda, right, who can continue to live out 11 beautiful years, um, that there's validity there. And so I would say as an organization, as a policy, we don't show up to auctions, we don't try to purchase animals. Very unfortunately, there are more than enough animals that come to us as we are kind of in a responsive mode. Um, but there are folks out there who as part of investigations may do that, and, and I do understand why. Thanks. Yeah, and just fellowship too, I, I think that's a real case-by-case -case situation. Um, I, after a conference, the Asia for Animals ch conference in China, in October, I went with Peter Lee from Humane Society International uh, to Northeast China to sort of document some of the dog slaughter stuff. Um, and we went to a couple of large facilities, but on the last day, we encountered this dog that was tied up outside a butcher stand at open air market that was about to be killed and they were chopping up another dog inside. And yeah, we, we paid $100 to acquire her and would do it again, you know, to not do that and have that on our conscience for the rest of our lives, knowing that we could have saved that individual animal and didn't, uh, I think would have been a far greater impact. And, um, the happy ending is that she ended up being flown over in December and my parents adopted her and so she's living a happy life in Illinois with two siblings and uh, a big huge yard to chase squirrels around in. So very happy that we chose to do that. Thanks, Chris. Any, any other questions? Okay, uh, then let's all thank Megan for her time. That was amazing. <laughs>